he had some friends over for dinner with the family. The conversation turned to global warming, and everybody agreed there's a real problem. We've got a climate crisis. So we went round the table to talk about what we should do. The conversation came to my 15-year-old daughter, Mary. She said, I agree with everything that's been said. I'm scared and I'm angry. And then she turned to me and said, Dad, your generation created this problem. You better fix it. The evidence behind this dramatic insight that we have now become a planetary force of change does not come from models or theory. It comes from these kind of observations. The hockey stick patterns which we've become so familiar with when it comes to pressures on the planet. And what you see is the upper left-hand corner here is the classical carbon dioxide hockey stick. But you know, you can pick any parameter that really matters for business or our well-being. It looks the same from biodiversity loss, ocean acidification, deforestation, eutrophication, overuse of rare earth metals. They have this pattern of very limited impact from the Industrial Revolution 250 years ago up until the mid-1950s, and that's where we have the takeoff point. Ten years after the Second World War, we're three billion people, and we put in the high gear of what has been called the moment of the great acceleration of the human enterprise. 1990 is the break point. That's where we start seeing, for the first time, things collapsing abruptly. But from 1990 onwards, we start seeing these abrupt changing costing to the economy. And this is a really key insight, that from 1990 onwards, we filled up the atmospheric space, we filled up the planetary space. We are, as science now can conclude, which I find so dramatic, humanity can disrupt the Earth system stability, and we have reached a saturation point where we're hitting the ceiling of the biophysical capacity to support humanity. This is ice core data over the northern hemisphere. It's the last 100,000 years. It's a good period to observe because we've been modern humans during the last 150,000 years. So we've had the same intellectual and, let's say, physical capacity to develop civilizations. On the y-axis, you have temperature variability, a good proxy of how it was to live on Earth. And it was a jumpy ride indeed. In fact, we were hunters and gatherers during this period. We were down to a few million people on Earth. You have a cold point here where sea levels were 70 meters lower than today. And we were, can you believe it, according to the latest DNA-based analysis, down to less than 10,000 10, fertile adults on Earth. You know, we were virtually extinct. We were hiding in the Ethiopian highlands, the only place where there was some food and water to keep us alive. And we were having, to put it very simple, a rough time. Until we leave the last ice age and go into this remarkably, not to say miraculously stable, Eden period, the Holocene, which is a plus minus one degree Celsius stable state where everything that we depend on establishes itself. In fact, the proof is clear that this is the case because we barely enter the Holocene and what do we do? Well, we invent the most important part of modern civilizations of all. We invent agriculture. Here you have our two degree target, the one that we've agreed upon we should not exceed. And this is unpublished data on the tipping points we, according to science, are at risk of hitting. So what you find is that when we start approaching something around 1.5 to 2 degrees, tropical coral reefs are bound to tip over. The Arctic summer sea ice will disappear at around 2 degrees or so. Alpine glaciers, Greenland in fact, has an uncertainty range between 1.5 and 4, where we might have irreversible melting of the Greenland ice sheet, which leads to another 7 meter sea level rise. The Amazon is feared to be at risk at 4 degrees, the place we're heading during this century, and so on and so forth, up until, in fact, the worst case scenario of losing large parts of the East Antarctic ice shelf. First, I just want to emphasize is that this is the temperature curve. Do not ever sort of say, hesitate on the fact that the world is warming and the IPCC concludes very clearly that humans are the dominant cause of that warming. What you see here is the absolute latest update, including 2014, which, by the way, is the warmest year on record. So never believe the skeptic uh, myth that warming has halted or even stalled over the past 15 years. Recent work just coming out two or three weeks back, moreover, confirms again that the warming actually is probably more fast even than what the IPCC has stated, depending on the uncertainties in how we measure weather and climate, in particular the polar regions. But the most important is this. 
Now, you see, we are on average following a path that will take us to four degrees warming by the end of this century. Um, four degrees Celsius temperature rise would look ugly. Um, <clears throat> among other things, that would be the hottest the Earth has been in 30 million years. Um, sea levels would rise at least three to six feet, and this excludes some really uh, 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 tail end possibilities, but three to six feet at least. And persistent drought would cover about 40% of the currently occupied land on Earth, which would wreak havoc on ag agriculture uh, in East Asia, in Africa, South America, Western US. All this combined would produce hundreds of millions of people who had been driven from their homes, either by their cities being swamped by sea level rise or by hunger or by all the attendant ills that come along with those things. And to boot, probably somewhere around half of the known species on Earth would go extinct. I came to climate change not as a scientist or an environmental lawyer, and I wasn't really impressed by the images of polar bears or melting glaciers. It was because of the impact on people and the, the impact on their rights, their rights to food and safe water, health, education and shelter. And I say this with humility because I came late to the issue of climate change. When I served as UN High Commissioner for Human Rights from 1997 to 2002, climate change wasn't front of my mind. I don't remember making a single speech on climate change. I knew that there was another part of the United Nations, the UN uh, Convention on Climate Change, that was dealing with the issue of climate change. It was later when I started to work in African countries on issues of development and human rights. And I kept hearing this pervasive sentence, oh, but things are so much worse now. Things are so much worse. And when I explored what was behind that, it was about changes in the climate, climate shocks, changes in the weather. I met Constance O'Kellett, who had formed a women's group in eastern Uganda. And she told me that when she was growing up, uh, she had a very normal life in her village, and they didn't go hungry. They knew that the seasons would come as they were predicted to come. They knew when to sow, and they knew when to harvest, and so they had enough food. But in recent years, at the time of this conversation, they had nothing but long periods of drought and then flash flooding, and then more drought. The school had been destroyed, livelihoods had been destroyed, their harvest had been destroyed. She formed this women's group to try to keep her community together. And this was a reality that really struck me because, of course, Constance O'Kellett wasn't responsible for the greenhouse gas emissions that were causing this problem. Indeed, I was very struck about the situation in Malawi in January of this year. There was an unprecedented flooding in the country. It covered about a third of the country. Over 300 people were killed, and hundreds of thousands lost their livelihoods. And the average person in Malawi emits about 80 kilograms of CO2 a year. The average US citizen emits about 17.5 metric tons. So those who are suffering disproportionately don't drive cars, don't have electricity, don't consume very significantly, and yet they are feeling more and more the impacts of um, the changes in the climate, the changes that are preventing them from knowing how to grow food properly and knowing how to um, look after their future. I have five grandchildren now. I feel very happy as an Irish grandmother to have five grandchildren. And I think about their world and what it will be like when they will share that world with about nine billion other people in 2050. We know that inevitably it will be a climate-constrained world because of the emissions we have already put up there. But it could be a world that is much 
more equal and much fairer and much better for health and better for jobs and better for energy security than the world we have now. If we have switched sufficiently and early enough to renewable energy and no one is left behind, no one is left behind. And just as we've been looking back this year in uh, 2015 to 1945, looking back 70 years, I would like to think that they will look back, that world will look back 35 years from 2050, 35 years to 2015, and that they will say, weren't they good to do what they did in 2015? We really appreciate that they took the decisions that made a difference and that put the world on the right pathway.